Hello, thank you for joining me. You probably already know quite a bit about the history of Western music, about how it's developed over the ages. But I wonder if you've thought much about the underlying mechanism, the unifying factor that enabled music that started out sounding like this. <laughs> to end up sounding like this. Well, a lot of the thinking that I and others have done over the years has convinced me that this unifying thread lies within the very sounds that we use to make music with. So in this series of programmes, I'm going to explore the influence that this internal structure of musical sound, the harmonic series, has had on the developments of each of the elements that go to make up music since the Middle Ages. The title of the series pays homage to the Greek mathematician and philosopher Pythagoras, because many of the theories that inform our analysis are attributable to him. In this and the programmes that follow, I aim to explore the correspondences that exist between the various elements that together make up music and how they have always been and always will be inseparable from the principles that Pythagoras propounded. Music as we understand it consists of various combinations and juxtapositions of rhythm, melody, harmony, dynamics and timbre or tone colour. Whatever its historical period, style, or ethnic origin. All music has rhythm. When two or more sounds of similar or different duration are heard in close succession, so they connect with each other to create patterns in the mind of the listener. When such patterns are combined with pitches, they give rise to the phenomenon we know as melody. Some, though not all, music features harmony, when there are successions of two or more simultaneously sounding pitches. sounds possess a certain intensity, dynamics in musical terms. Although there's a clear acoustical basis for the perception of dynamics, we're not going to discuss them in much detail in what follows. Because other than at a few points in history, such as the 1940s and 50s when integral serialism came to the fore, dynamics haven't had a structural role. They've been used mostly for contrast or for expressive purposes. Every sound, musical or otherwise, possesses particular properties that give rise to the perception of timbre or tone colour, the attribute that differentiates the sound of one instrument from another. Listen to these different instruments all playing the same note. Like dynamics, timbre has until relatively recently had a secondary role as a coloristic feature of music rather than as a structural one. But as we shall see, in a very real sense, timbre is the very element that has underpinned the changes that have determined the course of Western musical history since the Middle Ages. So it's with timbre that we begin our investigation. Pythagoras is generally credited with the discovery of the mathematical relationship between the length of a vibrating body, such as a string or a tube, and the pitch it produces when excited by plucking, breathing, striking, and so forth. And of course, strings and tubes are the essential vibrating components of many musical instruments. 
In simple terms, he found that vibrating air in short tubes produces high frequencies, and therefore high pitches, and long tubes produce lower frequencies. Gradually lengthening a tube, such as when a trombonist plays a glissando, illustrates this very clearly. <laughs> clarifications needed here because, of course, there are other factors that affect pitch in wind instruments. If a brass player vibrates his or her lips at a higher frequency, or if a woodwind player overblows, one of the tube's harmonics will be produced. And we're going to be talking about harmonics in quite a little bit in a moment. Now, in string instruments, the same principle applies generally, which is to say that long strings produce low frequencies and vice versa. But again, it's not quite so simple. What about the violin, cello or guitar that has four, six or more strings, all the same length, but that produce different pitches? Well, this is accounted for by differences of mass and tension. A thicker, more massive string produces a lower pitch than a thinner one of the same tension. And a string under greater tension produces a higher frequency than one of the same mass at a lesser tension. In this discussion, our focus needs only to be on pitch as a function of the length of a vibrating body. But Pythagoras also found that as well as vibrating along the entire length, bodies such as these vibrate along shorter divisions of their length simultaneously, in halves, in thirds, in quarters, and so on as far as the construction of the vibrating body will allow. These vibrating fractions of the overall length are therefore in whole number ratio to the overall length, so the frequencies produced must be in whole number ratio to it. The note produced by the overall length is the one that we perceive as having a certain pitch. It's known in acoustical terms as the fundamental. The simultaneously sounding tones of higher frequency that result from the vibrations of the divisions are referred to as harmonics, overtones, or upper partials. Here you see a representation of these multiple vibrations separately with their relative frequencies. F denotes the frequency of the fundamental, 2F therefore means double the frequency, 3F three times and so on. Notice that the higher divisions vibrate with progressively less energy, and therefore with diminishing amplitudes. This means that overall, there will be a progressive diminution in the intensities of the overtones. In reality, the intensities of these overtones, or upper partials, are not as uniformly related as this diagram might suggest. There are in fact considerable variations in the intensities, mainly due to the design of instruments and the materials from which they are made. And this is the factor that imparts a particular tone colour or timbre to an instrument or voice. The totality of partials, harmonics or overtones that occur in integer proportion to the fundamental and that in theory continue to infinity is known as the harmonic series. It can be represented in musical notation like this. Do bear in mind that although the pitches are indicated successively, this is only for convenience, as is the fact that the fundamental is indicated here as C2. The overtones, of course, sound simultaneously with the fundamental, and the frequency ratios indicated apply irrespective of which node happens to be sounding. Now this representation of the harmonic series is not altogether accurate, because the frequencies of the overtones indicated do not match exactly those of the corresponding pitches of equal temperament. Indeed, the sixth overtone, notated here as B-flat, and the tenth, notated as F-sharp, would sound decidedly flat to the well-tempered ear. Many of you will notice, and already know perhaps, that clear relationships in terms of musical intervals exist between the harmonics indicated in this example. This will be explored in considerable detail in the next programme. As we've already touched upon, 
most widely known effect of the harmonic series is that of imparting timbre to a sound. As we've seen and heard, a succession of similar notes played in similar dynamic in a similar register on different instruments all sound very different because the instruments have markedly different tone colours. This is because each instrument emits a particular sound spectrum in which the intensities of the overtones present differ to those of other instruments. The term spectrum, by the way, is routinely applied to sound in a manner analogous to its use in relation to light. Just as light of a certain colour consists of combinations of different wavelengths of light, musical sounds incorporate harmonics of different wavelengths or frequencies. Let's see how this works by looking at an example where we start with a sine tone, a sine tone being one without any harmonics, and where we add the partials of the harmonic series in order one at a time. Listen to how the added overtones colour the sound. This transformation is rather more striking if we listen to the very first sine tone with a faster attack, that's to say a faster beginning to the note, and then we listen to the sound at the very end of the process also with a faster attack. So you can see and hear very clearly that the overtone content of a particular sound is the thing that accounts for the instrumental colour that we perceive. Now this in fact is something of an oversimplification because the relative intensities of harmonics can vary not only from one instrument to another, but also in the same instrument, at different phases of a note, in different registers, or at different dynamic levels but the brain averages all these differences and we perceive a unified timbre. We're going to see a few examples that use digital sound samples processed by software that separates the sound into its individual sine wave components. This uses a process known as Fourier analysis after the 18th century French mathematician. The amplitude, in other words, the intensity of each partial can be seen on the moving graph that accompanies the sounds. Each instrument plays the same note, G, which is 392 hertz and at a similar dynamic. First, let's look at the flute spectrum. It has relatively few accompanying partials, so its tone has a certain purity. In the case of the clarinet, certain partials are absent, and the higher frequencies are prominent, lending it its characteristic sound quality. Most viewers would probably describe the sound of the clarinet as being richer and brighter than that of the flute, and if you compare the frequency content of the sounds, you can see clearly why this is. The clarinet timbre is much richer in partials, with more at the higher frequencies. The trumpet spectrum shows strong upper partials compared to the flute and clarinet, and this accounts for its rich, bright sound. Compare that to the spectrum of the violin, which you can note contains a great many very high frequencies, albeit at lower amplitude. Now the piano.
Perhaps you noticed the difference in the spectrum between the attack and decay phases of the sound. The harmonic content is extremely complex during the attack phase, but during the decay it is less so. This illustrates quite clearly what we said earlier about the harmonic contents of sounds varying during different phases. In all of these examples we see variations in the numbers and the intensities of harmonics, but no variation in their frequencies, which are always in whole number ratio to the fundamental. This puts them in the category of harmonic timbres. Other non-sustaining musical instruments, especially metallic ones such as bells, gongs and cymbals, exhibit spectra in which the partials are not in whole number ratio. These timbres are termed inharmonic. Consider this spectrum of a gong. If we look closely, we can see that there's a great deal of what's termed noise in the spectrum of the gong. But there are also distinct peaks at certain frequencies. And we can hear these as fairly distinct pitches. Close examination of their frequencies makes it clear that they are not in whole number ratio. Well, this is even more pronounced in the case of the tam-tam, where -tam, there's even more noise and where a great many more peaks are present. But again, there is very little resembling a whole number ratio between the frequencies. We'll take a closer look at these peak frequencies in the next programme on melody and harmony. So as we've seen, the relative intensities of simultaneously sounding overtones is the most significant factor in our perception of timbre and therefore of our appreciation of the sonic characteristics of different musical instruments. We've also noted a difference between harmonic and inharmonic timbres. And very importantly to this discussion, we noted that the simpler rational frequency ratios produce harmonic timbres, whereas the more complex irrational ratios give rise to inharmonic timbres. In the next program, we're going to look closely at the relationship between these frequency ratios and the ways in which melody and harmony have developed in the context of both tonal and atonal music. So please do subscribe to this channel and click on the bell to make sure you don't miss the next episode. So if you've got any comments or if you've got any questions, please do leave them in the comments section below. And if you know anybody who might be interested in this, do share it with them, please. So I hope you found this interesting. I hope you found it useful. Thanks again for joining me and I very much hope you will join me again.